Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Look, we've, we've heard a lot about the shutdown today. We've heard a lot about impacts on families and on businesses and on our society in general. Um, we've heard a speech just recently on the floor of the Senate about how Democrats don't want border security, which wouldn't, cannot be further from the truth. The fact of the matter, last year... Uh, we appropriated $21 billion for border security. For 2008, that was in 2017. For 2018, it was $21.5 billion. The truth is, is everybody that I know of that serves in this body, whether it be Democrat or Republican, wants to make sure that we have our borders secure. Unfortunately, uh, the president, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, the president came in with his budget request last year to the Homeland Security Subcommittee Appropriations, which I serve on as ranking member, and asked for $1.6 billion for a wall. And guess what that subcommittee did? And guess what the Appropriations Committee did? We gave him $1.6 billion for that wall. And then sometime later, now the Senate didn't pass that bill, I might add. But sometime later, the president came in and said, no, I want $5 billion for a wall. And now it's $5.7 billion for a wall. We had asked for a report on how this money was going to be spent, and they sent us a report on how the $1.6 billion was going to be spent. With no comparative analysis on how technology or manpower or anything else to secure that border might work more beneficially to keep our border secure and be more cost-effective for the American taxpayer. So what did the president do? Well, 25 times he said, I'm going to shut the government down. And guess what happened? The government's shut down. It doesn't take a genius to do that. And now we've heard the stories, and they'll continue, especially after tomorrow when working folks won't get their paycheck, of the impacts on this country, on average Americans who could lose their homes, their autos, not be able to send their kids to school, not be able to afford health care. The list goes on and on. And I ask, is this how you make America great again? Is this how it's done? Because it's not working. And so Senator Cardin came to the floor a bit ago, and he said, I want to put up not show bills, I want to put up Republican bills that this body's already passed and that the House has just passed this last week. So that the Senate would do their job and hopefully reopening the government. I think there's enough votes to do it. I think there's enough votes to override a veto. And the majority leader's response was, no, we're not going to do this. We want to take up a bill in Israel. I'm telling you, I am a big supporter of Israel. But I take an oath of office to protect this country first. And we're turning our back on this country. We can continue to have the debate about the best way to secure the border. But it should not be done holding the American people hostage. It should be done by having the debate 
that this body, the most deliberative body in the world, I was told before I got here, got to serve with great senators. Got to serve with Robert C. Byrd and Richard Luger and, and Kennedy and Bacchus. The list goes on and on. We don't debate. We don't even vote. In fact, we don't even live up to the, the Constitution's goals for us, requirements for us, whatever you want to call it. We're a co-equal branch of government. We shouldn't be allowing the president, as Senator Durbin said, a lot asking for a permission, ship, permission slip from the president to be able to do our business. Bring the bills to the floor to open this government and vote on them. If they go down, they go down. I think they'll pass. If the president vetoes them, or the president vetoes them, bring them back for a veto override. It is as simple as that. I wonder what the forefathers would think today if they saw this body, a shell of its former self. And it's not due to the rules. It's due to the fact that we have leadership that won't live up the obligation of this body it's set up to begin with. We've got work to do here. We've got a lot of work to do. And that work starts with opening the government of the United States. If we don't do it, or if we say we're only going to do it with permission from the president, then we all ought to hold our head in shame. I yield the floor. It is Tuesday, the 15th of January of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Just a little pinch of smoked hot Hungarian paprika makes all the difference. You can use the Spanish kind, but Hungarian is usually what you'll find on your shelves. Okay, well, uh, before we start off, I'll just give you a little bit of a uh, uh, diary entry here on uh, the Chronicle of My Grief. I went and purchased uh, an urn for my son yesterday. Uh, I'd been looking around for a little bit. I never purchase anything right off the ship, you know, right away. I usually go to a couple of different places. I see something I like and I walk away. And then I go someplace else and check out things and then uh, make up my mind. So I did that. And uh, so uh, I'm glad I got that out of the way. Uh, been having some tough times still. Um, I got really good support from some family. And then another family, maybe uh, their grief process causes them to, let's say, not be so supportive. And that's always an issue, I suppose, when you expect more out of people, especially family. But there's that, so I'll muddle through it. And uh, just trying to get through each day, I wake up in the middle of the night and it just washes over me and... I'll be doing something in the middle afternoon and it will wash over me. And I will admit that as soon as I get done with this show, uh, while I'm doing a bit of post-production work, it washes over me and I have to stop, take care of that for a few minutes and then get back to living my life, which is uh, hard, I must admit. Okay, well, it looks like uh, Trump sold, uh, sold, <laughs> served up a bunch of cold hamburgers to the Clemson Tigers for winning the college football championship. Because um, uh, in Trump's America, class is best served as cold fast food. Everybody knows that. Um, I would have thought that maybe, you know, since this is modern times and Clemson is a top-notch uh, sports program. They would have dietitians making sure that the athletes stay away from exactly the food that Trump was serving at the White House. Uh, I'd be a little concerned. Cold hamburgers? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I've seen the health department reports at Mar-a-Lago, and it isn't good. Oh, my God, that place should be shut down. And if I was a foreign leader 
I'd be bringing a food taster with me, and if they are having problems, I'd uh, probably stay away from the buffet line. So uh, uh, that was somewhat of a joke, uh, especially since Trump says that he was a great athlete. He knows nothing about health. How could he have been a great athlete? doesn't make any sense. Well, he probably thought he was being, you know, on a sports-themed sports team. Not really sports, just sports themed. All right. Well, um, all sorts of other things are going on in the world, of course. Uh, A little rundown quickly here. Uh, Oh, actress Carol Channing has passed away at age 97. God, I liked her. And when I lived in the Bay Area, she was a a local stalwart. Just lived right down the peninsula and you'd see her... You know, in town doing some sort of production well into her her 80s. And it might have even been when she was in her young 90s. Because she was what is known in theater as a trooper. Indeed. Facebook is going to invest $300 million to help local news survive. I thought thought Sinclair Broadcasting was doing that. Oh, it looks like uh, there's some cotton seeds that Chinese have... The Chinese have sent to the moon and they're sprouting. So I guess we're going to have a cotton farm on on the moon. Uh, That could be interesting. Light as air. The uh, shutdown looks like it's keeping the FDA from approving life-saving drugs. And it's actually Trump thinks it's probably stopping a lot of things like the Mueller investigation. He doesn't know that it's still going on. He doesn't know. Uh, I would, if I was on the Mueller team, and I know you're supposed to kind of stay away from politics, but if you shut down the government and essential aspects of the government are not working to the detriment of the safety and security of the population, let alone democracy in general, I would think Mueller might be looking at that as, you know, uh, maybe uh, obstruction at the least. And uh, being a Russian asset right there in the Oval Office. One of those two or both. All right. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Of course, that was Tester at the top using his time to uh, explain to people that Trump has a lot of money for border security. Well, a lot. There's $25 billion. And there was another $1.7 billion. He just doesn't spend it. Because spending it doesn't serve his purpose. He has to shut down the government. Because in real estate, property is always more valuable when delivered vacant. Continuing on here in the Bistro Cafe, a U.S. military translator and his family were detained at George Bush International Airport in Houston, Texas, after their visas were canceled midair. Trump's border wall creates deep divisions among Texas landowners in its path because no one wants to have a taking, except the person doing the taking. And the Supreme Court stayed out of the fight over whether Trump's appointment of Matthew Whitaker as acting attorney general is unlawful. Well, if he's acting, just like, you know, he's he's a method actor, maybe that's not illegal. But they're staying out of that fight. And it may be because there's uh, other other uh, cases in the pipeline. After the break, we then move to the chef's table where Trump mocks immigrants for showing up to their court dates. He doesn't think we should have judges. He thinks we're the only country in the world that has judges. Have to get rid of them. And Mike Pence, along with Mike Pompeo, belong to a doomsday cult and maybe trying to bring on the apocalypse. They don't want to confine it to their own little heaven's gate. They want to take the rest of us with them, too. And I say, hey, religious freedom means I get to say no. All that and more in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right-ish of the page is the chat room link, and do engage us there. To the left-ish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice over there the contribute button, and if you could become a continuing Patreon to Netroots Radio, your a recurring contribution keeps the lights on and uh, we pay our bills and well we're unable to do this without you your generosity puts a big dent in that responsibility and we are forever thankful for that so so do if you're not already do become a recurring patreon on netroots radio and that way resistance radio keeps resisting as the founders originally intended if you would like to, you can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And I can be found there as Justice Putnam. I, of course, share that on social media as soon as I get to it. Also, uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Okay, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of Think Progress by Rebecca Entralgo. U.S. Customs and Border Protection detained a U.S. military interpreter and his family at George Bush International Airport in Houston, Texas last week after their visas were canceled mid-air. Do they get a refund on their tickets? Maybe not. Afghan national Mohammed Asif Matakal, along with his wife and their five children, boarded a plane from Afghanistan without a problem, but learned U.S. custom officials had revoked his visa upon arrival. The family first caught the suspicion of uh, Customs and Border Protection after they handed officers an unsealed document containing their medical records. The State Department website warns immigrants to not open those packets, but does not outline what might happen if they do. Lawyers for the family claimed either the wife or children had mistakenly unsealed the documents. Well, CBS officials told the interpreter, who has gone through extensive background checks for his career assisting the military, that the U.S. consulate in Afghanistan had flagged his visa and ma- emailed him to return to the office, which he did not do. Emailed. And he didn't. How about a certified letter? So that you know the message got to him. No, can't do that. The uh, interpreter, and I'm only saying the interpreter because I am finding his name exceedingly difficult to pronounce. The interpreter and his family were then taken into custody and threatened with deportation back to Kabul, where he would, in this reporter's opinion, meet us his certain demise. And maybe his family, too. Apparently, the visa was not canceled until he was midair, Texas Representative Sheila Jackson Lee told the Houston Chronicle. When customs officials had to check his credentials, it showed there was a problem with the visa for the entire family. The translator is one of thousands of interpreters who were awarded special immigrant visas through the Afghan Allies Protection Act enacted in 2009. Which means the bulk of it was during the Obama administrations. And we know how Trump feels about what went on during the Obama administrations. Must undo. If Trump was Ramsey II, every other statue, every other edifice throughout the whole realm would be defaced. Because it happened before Trump Ramsey's. Now, interpreters are often targeted by the Taliban for their work with the U.S. military. In 2014, the International Refugee Assistance Project estimated that an Afghan interpreter was killed every 36 hours. 
Interpreters and their families are eligible for residency in the U.S. if they provide letters of support from American officials and can properly demonstrate that their lives are at risk in their countries of origin. This process, however, can take years and requires extensive background checks on all persons involved. The, this interpreter is currently being held in an immigration detention center in Houston where he plans to apply for asylum. His wife and children were released after 24 hours on humanitarian parole, which allows them to temporarily remain in the country. Despite the fact that the interpreter and other Afghan and Iraqi nationals have gone through extensive vetting pro procedures to receive visas, under the Trump administration, their ability to remain in the country has been made less certain. Top administration officials like DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen Seagull and White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders, hi Sarah Smokey, I lie, have frequently tried to link immigration with terrorist activity, with DHS claiming custom border protection prevented nearly 4,000 known or suspected terrorists from crossing the border during fiscal year 2018, and that is a lie. That number was proved to be severely inflated. Only six known or suspected terrorists were actually stopped by customs border protection, and that was at airports. Now, I just want to make sure that we understand this. A U.S. military translator of Afghan origin who went through a whole career, we're talking 15 or more years with the U.S. military, granted asylum in the United States, has a visa, mistakenly opens up the medical packet. Okay, not a biggie. We'll figure this out. But they threaten him with deportation and certain death at the hands of the Taliban, his whole family? Well, as I said, Zegan. Pike wrote a rather longish piece here for Think Progress that we have as an offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. Well, there's deep divisions among Texas landowners in uh, the path of Trump's border wall. Uh, even those who support new construction say they stand to lose pretty much everything that they've worked for their whole lives. But, uh, some of them uh, don't really want to lose their property. And some people think they're going to get what is due them. And if you've ever uh, had dealings with Trump before, <laughs> you'll see what you're due. When Nori Garza bought seven acres of riverfront land in South Texas, all she wanted was a quiet place for leisure time with family. It was the trees. Some of them hundreds of years old that grabbed the attention of her late husband when they made the purchase eight years ago. A small boat la launch that would let them float down the Rio Grande on weekend afternoons was a selling point for Nori. A historic home on the property built a century ago by early residents of the town of Mission gave her a maybe someday restoration project to tinker with. Then last year, federal officials showed up. Garza was told that the border wall would soon be push, pushing through just north of the old homestead, cutting off about five of the property's seven acres from the rest of the United States. Other than that, there have been few details about the project because they're making it up as they go along, in this reporter's opinion. They talked about having gates, but they couldn't guarantee it. They said that basically they don't know. Garza said. Dozens of property owners are grappling with similar news in the Rio Grande Valley, where construction of a physical barrier on the border was authorized and funded by Congress last year on land the government doesn't yet own. Bulldozers are ready to roll, not just through family getaways like the Garzas, 
but also across the vast open lands of the nearby National Butterfly Center and Benson State Park. Well, who cares about that on the other side? Empathy? Planning for the future? No, small time, immediate gain right now. And that's what immediate means. Now, federal officials have tried to mollify objectors by promising to build access gates with security codes at regular intervals, but many of the property owners are concerned they will pro- also provide access targets to, uh, well, traffickers. And I have to say, there's really not a whole lot of traffickers in the middle of nowhere, but there is a lot coming in through regular ports of entry. Supporters of the wall frequently portray the project as a basic necessity demanded by men and women in uniform, but uh, other landowners beg to differ. The Border Patrol has 3,000 active agents in the Rio Grande Valley sector alone, plus scores of high-tech surveillance platforms that gives them overwatch capacity for the entire area. Oh, you mean Big Brother? They can zoom in on the butthole of a bunny rabbit. There is no reason that they're not already apprehending everybody because they can watch them drive to the river, load up, paddle across, unload, and they'll have a dozen Border Patrol agents there to greet them all day, every day. A landowner by the name of Wright said, such high-tech solutions have been long been central to counter-arguments to Trump's wall and are probably one of the reasons for the historically low levels of illicit border crossings there today. I mean, we're talking about Border Patrol agents who will kill 14-year-old kids out pheasant hunting on their property because they're Americans. But you happen to be brown. And, you know, you just have to kill somebody just to be sure, and you'll figure it out later. And they did. us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, The U.S. Supreme Court yesterday stayed out of the fight over whether Donald Trump's appointment of Matthew Whitaker as acting attorney general is unlawful by rejecting a motion relating to the matter filed in a pending firearms related case. The court turned away the request made by Barry Michaels, a criminal defendant in a federal case whose lawyers challenged Whitaker, a former federal prosecutor, being named in court papers as the acting attorney general after Trump fired Attorney General Jeff Sessions on November 7th. The court, in a brief order, also declined to hear Michaels' appeal in the underlying case. Michaels filed suit in Nevada challenging a U.S. law that bars him from buying a firearm, Due to prior nonviolent criminal convictions, his lawyers decided to take Whitaker's appointment as an issue in their depending appeal before the high court because Sessions was originally named as a defendant in the case. Michael's lawyers argued that Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, the department's number two official, should have succeeded Sessions under a federal law that vests full authority in the deputy AG should the office of the AG become vacant. Now, Trump has nominated William Barr, who is being uh, uh, confirmed, or well, at least going through the hearings for confirmation. He better not be confirmed. Do you think this guy's really going to tell you the truth? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll recuse myself. After all that he's written and the secret memos that all the strategy he's already laid with the, the White House? I think not. 
Some of the lawyers are involved in a similar effort to challenge Whitaker's appointment brought before a federal judge in Maryland, and that's what I alluded to earlier. Uh, this particular case is going to wend its way up to the Supreme Court, or, or the other cases will wend their way up to the Supreme Court in due time. And I actually think that had something to do with it, because in this particular case, I, I don't really think they also really didn't want to get involved in the question of, uh, you know, felons having guns, even nonviolent felons. That may have been part of it, too. The DOJ has defended the legality of Whitaker's appointment, saying Trump was empowered to give him a job under a 1998 law called the Federal Vacancies Reform Act, even though he was not a Senate-confirmed official. They're using an act in which he doesn't qualify. Well, congressional Democrats had raised concerns Whitaker could undermine Robert Mueller's investigation between Trump and Moscow. And in this reporter's opinion, of course, Whitaker is supposed to do that, and so is Barr. Uh huh. Well, that brings us to our break. So why don't we go to our break, and when we come back, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, Trump the prequel. There's a theory that explains the current presidency is not an aberration, but a culmination. After all, according to PolitiFact, the presidential candidate who told the most lies before Trump was Romney, and before that, McCain. There's a trend. The movie Vice goes back to the days of Bush and Cheney, or more accurately, as the film notes, Cheney and Bush. It's not a lot here that we didn't know. Their administration was a time of rampant corruption and a pernicious exploration of constitutional and statute law for workarounds to advance fringe ideologies and personal agendas. But seeing it played out on a screen in the current context is potent and begs some obvious questions. As a cinematic effort, Vice has it going on. Amy Adams portrays the force of nature that remains wife Lynn. Sam Rockwell has the clueless George W. down. And a 40-extra-pound Christian Bale's Dick Cheney is one for the ages. Now, any exploration of an alpha male anti-hero is, of course, going to examine family relationships, and the way Cheney ends up dealing with the issue of his out-gay daughter is perhaps as revealing as anything you'll ever learn about this man. Director Adam McKay gives the subject matter here a treatment similar to that in his The Big Short from 2015, and then some. In this one, you'll be addressed directly. Here's some interesting menu items in a restaurant scene. Be treated to a bedroom interpretation of Macbeth, and that's before you discover the identity of the mystery narrator. A valid question is whether Cheney and Company's treatment advice is too light. Given their ongoing potential exposure to war crimes charges, you'll have to decide whether the comedy here is black enough to suit and for that contemporary connection make sure you stay through the credits this has been take two movie review i'm mike friend catch up with us at take two movie and feed us back on our page on youtube this is scientific american 60 second science i'm christopher intagliata Birds in Europe have the same problem as residents of cities like New York and L.A., a housing crisis. Not enough nest space to go around. For a species called pied flycatchers that migrate from West Africa, things can get deadly if they end up nesting in the wrong spot. There's no chance for them. Yalmer Samplonius is a climate change ecologist at the University of Edinburgh. He says the flycatchers face fearsome foes in the form of bigger resident songbirds called great tits. The great tit basically splits open the skull at the back and eats the brain. That's the gist of it. Samplonius and his colleague Christian Both recorded more than a decade's worth of those conflicts in nearly a thousand nest boxes in the Dutch countryside. They determined that warmer winters can boost resident great tit numbers, increasing the chance of flycatcher slaughter. 
but warmer springtime temperatures can throw the two species' nesting times out of sync, which would actually reduce deadly conflict. In addition, over the past 30 years, male flycatchers seem to be arriving earlier and earlier, regardless of springtime temperature trends. In other words, it's complex. But the upshot is that conflicts between the two birds are on the rise when some of these shifting factors align. And when they do, as many as 1 in 10 male flycatchers can die at the claws of great tits. The death tolls are in the journal Current Biology. The bloodbath doesn't seem to be affecting the overall flycatcher population yet, perhaps because the victims are primarily males that arrive late, destined to fail at the mating game anyway. But Samplonius says if climate change increases the numbers of resident birds, migrants could increasingly arrive at their breeding grounds and find an eviction notice. Or worse, a literally head-splitting situation. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. It's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution And you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Can you be arrested for being mean to the police on the Internet? I'm Baratunde Thurston from The Onion, and also... (laughs) Mother... (laughs) You're listening to the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Recently, the Exeter, New Hampshire police arrested a local man for writing a comment on a news website that accused the police chief of covering up for a corrupt officer. That statement allegedly violated New Hampshire's criminal defamation law that makes it a misdemeanor to intentionally and falsely disparage another person. New Hampshire's criminal defamation law, along with others like it in 24 additional states, in essence makes it a crime to say mean things about people. Now, to be sure, freedom of speech does not give anyone the absolute right to spread lies about a fellow citizen, which is why civil remedies are available. But criminal defamation laws are another story. First, you shouldn't go to jail for saying something mean about somebody. And second, the laws chill speech. And third, they are disproportionately used against people who criticize the police or politicians. Fortunately, the criminal case in New Hampshire has been dismissed and the ACLU has sued in New Hampshire federal court to have that state's criminal defamation law struck down as violating the First Amendment. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Tuesday marks the 25th day of the government shutdown, but no negotiations on a way out are even scheduled. Nancy Pelosi will bring another round of funding measures to the floor this week that propose to temporarily reopen the government. Neither of the bills expected to pass the House will include additional resources for a border wall. The president has said repeatedly he will veto any measures that don't include billions of dollars more to construct a wall or barrier at the U.S. border with Mexico. And Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said he won't even bring such bills to the floor for a vote if Donald Trump won't sign them. William Barr, Trump's pick to be the next attorney general, will appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee Tuesday, the first step in his confirmation process. 
In his opening remarks, Barr addresses the past criticism of the special counsel investigation and makes the case that he has no plans to interfere in the investigation. From his prepared remarks, quote, The country needs a credible resolution of these issues. If confirmed, I will not permit partisan politics, personal interests, or any other improper consideration to interfere with this or any other investigation. End quote. President Trump's attorney general nominee, William Barr, says tonight it's important to let Robert Mueller complete his work, adding the country needs a credible resolution of these issues. Barr is also sure to get questions about the revelation that the FBI opened a counterintelligence investigation of President Trump in 2017 after he fired FBI Director James Comey to see if the president was secretly working with Russia. One factor was his comment to Russian officials the next day that the firing took away great pressure because of Russia. Another was what he told Lester about firing Comey. When I decided to just do it, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. The FBI's action followed an internal debate, but overlapped with its investigation of possible obstruction of justice whether it's a criminal investigation or a counterintelligence investigation. Mueller took over the investigation several days later, and nothing made public has ever said the president took direction from the Russians. Today, he said the investigation was started by FBI people who have been fired and were out to get him. As for Barr, he says it's important that Congress and the public are informed of the results of Mueller's investigation. Pete Williams, NBC News, Washington. Meanwhile, the fourth estate was busy over the weekend with two blockbuster news reports about Trump and Russia. In the first one, the New York Times reported that the FBI launched a counterintelligence investigation into whether the president was working on behalf of Russia after Trump fired FBI Director James Comey. Trump denied that allegation in remarks to reporters on Monday. I never worked for Russia. And you know that answer better than anybody. I never worked for Russia. Not only did I never work for Russia, I think it's a disgrace that you even asked that question because it's a whole big fat hoax. It's just a hoax. Yes, that is the 72-year-old president calling it a, quote, big fat hoax. What is he, eight? The second story comes from the Washington Post and alleges that Trump took measures to conceal details about a meeting he had with Russian President Vladimir Putin, including the confiscation of notes from an official U.S. interpreter who was present. Democratic leaders in the House are debating whether to subpoena the interpreter, as well as a range of other actions, as they use their new majority to ramp up oversight of the president. From the What Took You So Long files, House Republican leaders have finally moved to strip Steve King of his committee assignments over his comments about white nationalism. I regret the heartburn that has poured forth upon this Congress and this country, and especially in my state. That's as close as Iowa Congressman Steve King came to apologizing today for comments being called abhorrent, racist, and reckless by members of his own party. In a New York Times interview published Thursday, the Republican lawmaker asked, White nationalist, white supremacist, Western civilization. How did that language become offensive? Facing a growing backlash, today King took to the House floor to explain himself. Under any fair political definition, I am simply an American nationalist. This conviction does not make me a white nationalist or a white supremacist. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate, calling out King. Writing in the Washington Post, some in our party wonder why Republicans are constantly accused of racism. It is because of our silence when things like this are said. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi condemning King's comments, too. He said terrible things. Terrible things have been said by other people in this administration. I've been in a bigger fight than this one. King already has two primary challengers, one of whom told the Des Moines Register yesterday, I won't embarrass the state. Garrett Haig, NBC News, the Capitol. It's D-Day for Brexit. UK lawmakers vote Tuesday on Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit deal that was negotiated with the European Union. If it passes, that's the last big hurdle before the UK leaves the EU in March. If it fails, well, no one really knows what happens. Stay tuned. And finally, the second largest school district in the country is on strike. United Teachers Los Angeles walked out on Monday for the first time in 30 years. The teachers are demanding a 6.5% salary increase, smaller class sizes, and a greater commitment to investment in public education. I got the-
And that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. The UN estimates that 2019 could see the exodus of some 2.1 million Venezuelans, adding to the 3.3 million who've already fled the country. If those projections hold true, neighboring Colombia will likely receive the lion's share of refugees, solidifying the country's role at the front line of the crisis. Eric Schwartz is the president of Refugees International and commends Colombia for keeping its borders open and allowing those fleeing Venezuela to access basic services. In an awful situation, Colombia is standing up and doing pretty much the right thing. But Refugees International warns in a new report that that could change if Colombia fails to get more international support. Remember, 7 million Colombians remain internally displaced by fighting between the government and FARC rebels. And even though the two sides signed a peace deal in 2017, Colombia has a long way to go to help those whose livelihoods were destroyed by decades of war. And if the Venezuelan refugee issue distracts from that effort, attitudes towards refugees could change. In any situation where there are large numbers of people fleeing and trying to seek refuge, there are challenges with respect to host communities. And I think the government of Colombia could very much use the financial support of the international community in addressing what some of those host community concerns might be. To do that, Schwartz suggests those donating to the refugee response also help Colombia ensure its domestic peace process is successful. And crucially, Colombia can't be left to deal with the refugee crisis itself, lest a go-it-alone approach to migration prevail. We know what the worst case looks like. All you have to do is look in other parts of the world where governments are shunning borders. It means that people who are at risk suffer much more significantly, more people die, and that governments use hate-filled rhetoric to stoke polarization. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States because there's a whole lot more of the U.S. than meets the eye. And uh, we are currently uh, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is still dropping, surprisingly. Why is that? We will have a high of around 52 degrees, and overnight lows now are going to be a tad warmer in the low 40s, upper 30s, low 40s, and daytime highs in the low to mid 50s. We are partly cloudy at the moment with winds out of the north northeast at it's negligible one mile per hour. They call that light and variable. Some places, some people don't even register it. Later on, and when I, when I say later on, in a few hours, the winds will then shift from the north northeast to out of the east southeast at five to ten miles per hour, and will continue that clip and direction for the next several days because it is bringing rain. We will have uh, clouds during the day, a little bit of sun um, during the morning, a bit of sun in the afternoon, and uh, then clouds will be gathering. And later on tonight, um, maybe around 9 p.m. local time, we will have showers, which will be bringing in just about a third of an inch. And then we will be having between a third to three quarters of an inch for the next four or five days, maybe longer. So uh, we'll be having rain and showers and rain and showers and rain and showers. Bringing with it uh, some needed 
needed water, though it worries me because we need to have a snowpack. We haven't had any snow here, and it's already the middle of January. Eey. We'll see if we get snow. Probably around Easter time, right when you want to have a barbecue. Okay, oh, well, we'll get to barometric pressure in just a moment. Uh, pollen is rated at none. Uh, the air quality index is moderate at 74 parts per million, similar to yesterday. Though the daytime UV index is rated low, it has moved up a tick to two. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.58 inches, though visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 78%. Ooh, little, little humid there. And chilly. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. That's my P tape for anybody out there who needs, uh, you know, radio weather. Okay. Alrighty. Sometimes they pop. Sometimes they don't. London is 48 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 47 degrees and cloudy. Roma is 55 and sunny. Oh, I want to be there. Because an espresso right by the Spanish steps on a day like this, I got to tell you, it's nice. Kiev is 28 degrees with light snow. Kabul is 35 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 62 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 49 degrees and mostly cloudy with a gale advisory. So take care if you're in Tokyo. Uh, San Francisco, California is 51 degrees with a small craft advisory. So take care on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York remains a crisp 29 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Trago brings us this first amuse bouche, not counting the weather, of course, here in the chef's table or at the chef's table in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Donald Trump took time out during his speech at the American Farm Bureau's annual convention yesterday to mock immigrants for showing up to their court dates. And Rebecca Entrago writes for Think Progress, of course. Now, speaking about his proposed U.S.-Mexico border wall, for which he has requested $5.7 billion in funding, and over which he kick-started the ongoing government shutdown, even though he's got a buco amount of money. Oh, yeah. But he's uh, just decided that uh, Vlad doesn't want the government of the United States to be running properly because it's not in Russia's self-interest. Is that in this reporter's opinion? Or is that what law enforcement has found out? I hope we find I hope we find out. Uh, so Trump rebuked what he described as failed immigration policies, including catch and release, which allows undocumented immigrants to live in the country while their cases play out in immigration court. You know, kind of like the rule of law. And uh, of course, then Trump started deriding anybody who steps into this country. Well, what about all those Russian mobsters uh, bringing their family well, wives to have babies here? and buying uh, Trump properties at inflated prices to launder Russian mob money. What about that? What about those crooks and criminals and drug dealers and, uh, I don't know. What else do you call them? Oh, I know what you call them. White. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. 
la promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Travis Geddes of Raw Story brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Donald Trump's vice president and secretary of state appear to have a conflict between their private religious beliefs and their public duties, according to a financial journalist. Pence and Pompeo are each a genuine end-of-days believer in the apocalypse, said Financial Times journalist Edward Luce, who said their religious beliefs about the end times exerts a troubling influence on their duties. Generally, I believe a public figure's beliefs should be irrelevant to their job, Luce wrote. Whether they're atheist, Opus Dei, Buddhist, or Muslim should have no bearing on our assessment of their fitness for office. Yet, I cannot help but feel anxious that both of Donald Trump's main global envoys, Pompeo and Pence, have a conflict between their private beliefs and what they publicly claim to be doing. Luce argued that both Trump administration officials were part of a millennialian cult, and he worried their militant creed would influence their public policies to spark a final conflagration in which the righteous will vanquish the wicked. Well, of course they believe that. That's Billy Graham stuff. He had been advising presidents uh, for decades, right up until the day he died and met his own, I don't know, rising to wherever. Like we all will. Call me a serial fretter, Luce wrote, but I don't take comfort from the fact that Pence is a heartbeat away from being commander-in-chief, nor do I see Pompeo as one of the grown-ups restraining Trump. He's an enabler, not a preventer. Where Trump goes, Pompeo will follow. Let's just hope Trump never gets religion. Well, it's a little late for that. And they need their Antichrist. And who knew that they would fall in love so deeply? I thought that it you know, the the the, the mark of the beast would cause you to maybe uh, fight against that entity. Silly me. I read it, I don't know, with the eyes of uh, someone who read Thomas Merton instead of Alan Rand. Could be. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. And, of course, you know that Netroots Radio will broadcast on all day and all night. We'll meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you know, uh, restraining religion or at least having a really lovely egg dish for the lovely holidays. Velvety. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bone for two. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver.
Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golf clair Embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de retendre Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 